Yeah. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to another Project Blue at Summer live chat. This week, we're excited to have Dr. Linda Duguay from USC Sea Grant join us. Altacy and USC Sea Grant are partners in the Summer of STEM initiative, which is bringing science to the LA USD, sponsored by the Mayor's Fund LA. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome and we're glad you can join us. If you've joined us before, welcome back. By now, you know the drill. Dr. Dugay will give her presentation and then it will be followed by a Q&A session. So if you have any questions for her, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of the Zoom page and I'll be sure to ask Dr. Dugay your questions. If you want to watch previous live chats or register for future ones, please go to altacy-project-blue.org backslash live dash chats. I'll put that link in the chat as well for your convenience. Now, I wanna introduce our guest for today, Dr. Linda Dugay. Currently, she serves as the director of USC's Sea Grant Program and the director of research for the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies at USC. Um, she has had, uh, her resume is impressive and, um, you know, I, I could spend probably 40 minutes going over it all, but uh, I'll let her do that for you. So Dr. Duguay, thank you for joining us. And with that, take it away. Okay, well, good afternoon and thank you for that, Scott. It's been nice chatting with you for the last half hour or so. And I just wanna to say to everybody on the chat, good afternoon and as Scott says, happy Friday. Hopefully it's the beginning of a great weekend. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here to tell you a little bit about Sea Grant, but mostly I'm gonna tell you about USC's Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies, and I'm primarily gonna focus on our marine lab, the Philip K. Wrigley Marine Science Center on Santa Catalina Island, and talk about the research and education that we support out on Catalina Island. I'll be taking you on an adventure out to the Wrigley Science Center at Catalina, just some 22 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. And this is a nice little Google map, and um, you see the mainland of, uh, of California and LA, and our the university is actually right up here, somewhere between the 105 and the 101, the main campus of USC. And then we have a, uh, we keep our boat, the uh, Miss Christie, down in Fish Harbor at a lab known as the Southern California Marine Institute, which is a consortium of the uh, of USC, the UC's Cal, the UCLA, Cal States, and um, Occidental. So we travel, we go down to the dock there, and we travel across the uh, Southern California Bight out to uh, the lab here is on the west end, sucked into a nice little cove just near, this is the town of Two Harbors. For those of you know that hear about or know about Catalina, the town of Avalon is down on this far end from us. So it's a beautiful little spot tucked up here in a cove. So, but before we do that, um, and the dot in the middle we'll come back to, dot in the middle is, um, is a time series we've been running for quite a long time called the San Pedro Ocean Time Series, and it's also affectionately known as SPOT. So um, first I wanna talk about the, the Wrigley Institute. Um, Wrigley Institute is a uh, organized research unit. It's not a department with its own faculty and students, but rather it has what we call affiliated faculty and students from a, a wide variety of USC departments, like biological sciences, earth sciences, chemistry, environmental sciences, spatial sciences, archaeology and, and even engineering to name a few. Uh, most of the faculty are resident on the main in on, on the mainland, but they travel out to Catalina and spend some time depending anywhere from days to weeks out there to do their research. We have our own passenger vessel, the Miss Christie, which runs Monday through Fridays, as I mentioned from the Southern California Marine Institute. And the Wrigley mission the Institute's mission is to ensure global environmental solutions through frontier research and education in all aspects of the environment. And just as uh, this is the Miss Christie in, uh, in the uh, port of LA um, in Fish Harbor, and just to uh, show you some of the uh, exciting things that can happen when you go down to Fish Harbor to get on Miss Christie and see some of the charismatic sea life that lives actually in the port. The port is a very thriving environment these days. So now on to, on to Sea Grant. Um, sea Grant's actually housed within um, the Wrigley Institute, but it's also a what we call an organized research institute. Again, it's not a department with its own faculty and students, but rather 
Again, it has affiliated faculty. It's one of 34 Sea Grant programs that are found in all of the coastal and Great Lakes states, also programs in Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. It's a federal state university partnership with the primary support coming from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, fondly known as NOAA. Sea Grant programs receive a minimum of a million dollars in federal funding, and for every two dollars in federal funding, the state or the university provides a one dollar match. Our program has been receiving funding since 1969, shortly after the Marine Lab on Catalina was established in 1965. Sea Grant funds research projects, usually more applied in nature, addressing a problem that needs information or to possibly find a solution to a particular problem. We have outreach and education that work with various specialists that work with various industry and government partners, and we support graduate student research. Our own program does a lot of education programs uh, with middle, high school, and adult students. And as you heard from Jacob, we're partnering with all to see this summer a number of other informal institutes on the summer of STEM for the city of LA. Um, our Sea Grant work based is on the work is based on the need for relevant science as well as to inform our constituents' needs to understand and make wise decisions at the local, state, regional, and federal levels. Sea Grant, like Wrigley, utilizes a neutral non-advocacy advocacy approach in its work. We don't sort of take sides. So now, um, uh, fun, some fun history facts about USC and the marine sciences at USC. USC is a private institution. People um, I made, especially outside of California, are often confused about that. They think we're a state university. USC is actually the oldest private research university in Southern California. We were founded in 1880 in downtown LA, LA and USC hired its first marine biologist, um, Albert Brenner, Brennus Ulrich in 1901, who was also became the chair of biology. He studied fishes and invertebrates. And another interesting fact is he became a very close friend of the Venice developer, Abbott Kinney, who had an interest in science. And I actually found out it was the president at that time of the Southern California Academy of Sciences, which is interesting for a businessman to be the president of the California Academy. Um, so USC's first marine lab was established by Ulrey on the Venice Pier in 1910. And here I have a photo. This is actually a, an LA Times article about Ulrey being appointed and then looks very professorial in this photo here. I think that was getting close to his retirement. So as I say, it established the first um, marine biological station on the Venice Pier. Here's the, actually is the, uh, it was at the aquarium that was on the pier that Kinney had developed. And here's actually the marine biological station. Here's some of the tanks and facilities that they used at that time to rear marine organisms. And you can see some of the important people that were on the, um, the, uh, the staff and instructors there, including the president of the university, George Bovard, which again, I found really pretty fascinating. Um, or he was also um, acquired USC's first research vessel, the uh, Anton Dorr, which was a uh, diesel assisted sailboat. Um, and you can see, I, again, I always amazed at how people in, in the, at the turn of the century in the 20s would dress in full uh, suit and coat to go out to sample marine life, which is pretty fascinating. Unfortunately, the pier burnt down in uh, Venice. Unfortunately, the Venice Pier, along with the USC's biological station, burnt down in 1920, and it was not rebuilt at, at, at that time. However, USC continued to be very active in marine and ocean research through the support of another famous Los Angeles benefactor, Captain Alan Hancock, who was a wealthy landowner and an avid amateur marine scientist. He built the Alan Hancock Foundation building on the main campus, which was named after him, and is still a very large hub of marine research on the main campus. It hosts the Marine Environmental Biology Department and the Graduate Program in Marine Biology and Biological Oceanography. He also provided director search for research in several sailing vessels, the Valeros three and four, which made major expeditions throughout the Pacific, including the, Galap the Galapagos, collecting, describing, and studying the marine life. These collections are now housed across the street from the main campus at the LA Museum of Natural History and several of the curators and researchers there are adjunct, are adjunct members in the USC Environmental Biology Department. So now we're gonna fast forward to the, the Wrigley part of the story. So 
the uh, Philip K. Wrigley Marine Science Center was founded. It's a picture of it currently as it as it exists. I think pretty much everything's there that we have now. It was founded in 1965, but you have to go back to the beginning of the Wrigley's Families Association with Catalina to really understand what happened. In 1919, the Wrigley family acquired the island by buying into a land development company. And when they came out from Chicago to see what they had purchased, they fell in love with the island as it was and decided, my gosh, we can't possibly develop this island so that it turns out to look like Los Angeles. So they brought it outright and paid off everybody else and have owned the island company ever since. We're now in our fourth generation of the Wrigley family benefactors. They love the island as much as ever, and several of them now serve, continue to serve on the Wrigley Advisory Board. Um, in the 1960s, Philip Wrigley, son of William Wrigley Jr., founder of the gun company and purchaser of the island, was looking into the long-term future of the island, and he commissioned a master plan for the island that was consistent with the Wrigley's interest in maintaining most of it as an un, in an undeveloped state, but creating sort of commercial and non-commercial activities at the margins that would allow people from the mainland to come and appreciate the stunning natural beauty of the island and to enjoy its marine waters. And during that planning process, a famous California planner named Pereira suggested to the Wrigley's that they think about establishing a marine lab. And the marine lab idea took hold with the Wrigley family and so they approached USC and eventually donated 14 acres of land in the valley close to the town of Two Harbors. So you can see this is the, the, the beautiful valley with its 14 acres here. It's a really a beautiful spot. Um, and then um, it was a rapid development of oceanography and marine sciences in the, in the 70s. And the uh, National F Science Foundation, actually um, they applied and got funding to build this first of the marine, the mar actually the main marine laboratory that still exists now. Um, and um, after that, the uh, university found money to build the lab, uh, the dormitories and apartments that are up here. And this is the, uh, the cafeteria. So, but the university built this lab as a collaboration with other universities in Southern California and not just solely for its, its own use. So the, the lab was basically this building, the lab building and this, um, dorm and cafeteria and then there's also a decompression chamber and then there's also a, an office building which is really just a, a butler building a trailer kind of structure. So the uh, lab went along supporting science and education at a basic level for the next 30 years. However in the early 1990s the fiscal crunch caused USC to look very carefully at this facility and, and basically all of the programs that we had and out of that reevaluation came the idea around 1995 that the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies and a refurbished and revigorated Catalina Marine Lab should be established with several new faculty lines and education programs. And most of this was endowed at that time by the Wrigley family. Bill Wrigley and Julie Wrigley um, were major donors. Well, it also developed a larger presence on the main campus, better connecting the lab, which had been fairly isolated to the mainland. And the idea was to bring the marine sciences and environmental sciences across the campuses closer together to create a larger value for the science that was being done on both campuses and a new focus for environmental education programs. A major change with the establishment of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies was to think about who cares about the science we're doing and whose job is it to make connections between the university and the people who need our science to make better decisions. And that became the Wrigley Institute. Um, we also morphed our education programs from a philosophy of university education to a kindergarten through gray perspective. We do continue to run innovative undergraduate and graduate programs. However, we also feel that we must reach the decision makers of tomorrow, our K through kindergarten through 12th grade students and, our, and the decision makers of today, policymakers and business people. We also run a range of adult programs and retreats and most of the last piece of property that was developed was up here. It's called our Boone Conference Center. It's a state-of-the-art conference center that can uh, hold about 50 people. Um, so on to the Wrigley Marine Science Center itself. It's a lab close to the ocean. You can see it's very close to the ocean. Um, and there are about 130 marine labs in the United States and each shares that common feature. They're all facilities that are placed in close proximity 
to a special coastal or ocean setting to allow direct access to the environment and to provide the tools of the art, state of the art, science or education on the ocean right at the very waterfront. The Berkeley Marine Science Center is a pretty much a full satellite campus of USC. It's not just a laboratory, but it has, a, as I mentioned, a variety of housing operation uh, options. The original housing was um, basically re, re, redone. And these, as I say, are dorms and apartments. Down here, we had a first set of new housing came in in the early, in the early 2000s, which is, uh, again, two sets of dorms and two buildings that are apartments. And then finally, our Boone Conference Center, which is really very high quality housing. Um, we have a full service cafeteria that serves three meals a day every day. Um, some of the apartments also have their own cooking facilities so researchers and students can make their own meals. Um, we have a fleet of small boats down here and we even have our own sewage treatment plant which is maintained by the Wrigley staff. It's this little blue <laughs> pool up here. Um, we also pump um, clean marine ocean water from over the side up here to a storage tank that then delivers it to our laboratory and to our, our waterfront. Um, I know they say um, the lab is not just used by USC, but it's used by researchers from around the world. Uh, another unique feature of this Catalina lab is the ocean is at its doorsteps, as you can see, and it's a special piece of ocean. The water is very clean compared to the same ecosystem just 22 miles away on the mainland near LA, San Pedro, or Long Beach. It's very um, clear and open ocean seawater in, in contrast to the inshore waters of the mainland. Those inshore waters are sort of trapped up against the coastline of the various cities. And every time it rains, the loose pieces of 15 million people's lives flow into the, flow into the concrete rivers and drains and, and directly into the coastal waters. So, Catalina water is incredibly clean and the local organisms are very healthy and we can grow animals and plants in the water that you can't grow anywhere on the mainland. Another special feature of the marine web is that our cove here and an area along the coastline here at about eight tenths of a mile to a spot called Blue Cavern um, has been a marine reserve since the 1980s. It was first established by by the university requesting the state to sort of close it off because what was happening was a lot of the experiments and research that was being done in the cove was being, uh, people would come in and then basically take away equipment or affect that research. So they asked the state to sort of close off the cove as a special area of uh, biological significance. Um, but in, in 2012, um, when the state of California completed a science-based stakeholder driven process um, pursuant to the marine Life Protection Act, which was passed in 1999, they actually designated um, 124 marine protected areas, now called MPAs affectionately, around the state of California from the north to the south. And nine of those areas are on Catalina, and they include what is now the onshore, so further out, and the onshore Blue Cavern MPAs, or their sort of state marine conservation areas. Um, and the onshore MPAs is a total no take zone. Um, our staff continues to monitor use of these areas and now there's enforcement by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So now um, time to go on to our research and education highlights. So we'll just put in a couple of pictures. So just not all listening to me talk. So we have more pictures, but you can see how incredibly blue and clear the water is. This is again, the Miss Christie now sitting at our dock over here in Catalina. It's our suite of small boats that you can take out to study various areas of the cove and the offshore areas. And uh, two of the newer things that were done in Catalina, most probably in the last, I think, eight, ten, or eight, yeah, eight to ten years was we've installed a, to expand our, our laboratories. We were sort of limited in the laboratory space. We still have the same building that was built like in 19, um, 1968. So we've actually, through again funding from the National Science Foundation and some of our beneficiary, beneficiaries, were able to um, basically build this special greenhouse, which again houses, we can uh, run a lot of special experiments. One side of the house, actually the far side, is called the Blue Houses, and primarily marine organisms are raised there. That's where we raise some, which you'll hear about later, our oysters and mussels and clams and things. And then this side is called the 
the greenhouse, which again, we raise different types of plants and vines. Okay. So, and one of the things that the Wrigley Institute is very um, interested in is becoming more, sustain more sustainable and in working in sustainability science. So a few years back, we actually added some solar panels to the roof of our cafeteria and dorm. And actually this is the first solar installation by any part of the University of Southern California. And we're hoping in the future, we're working with the university and some solar cell folks to add a very large solar array that can maybe do uh, half of our total power usage. And so now um, onto our, some research and education highlights. Um, a long-term project of the Greenway Institute was the establishment in 1998 of an ocean time series. And I, as I said before, it's called the Satan Pedro Ocean Time Series, or SPOT. And I pointed out in the Google map at the start of the talk, it's kind of halfway out to Catalina in about 900 meters of water. Time series programs are very important around the world to provide scientists with long-term data sets, which helps help us observe changes and hopefully predict trends as the ocean environment changes both seasonally, annually, and decadingly, especially with current changing climate that's happening. We've conducted a monthly ocean monitoring program for the last 20 plus years. We take a variety of chemical, biological, and physical, physical measurements at multiple depths from the top of the water column to just a few meters off the bottom. And SPOT has also served as a microbial observatory for a since 2002, which originally was funded by the National Science Foundation and other private foundations have come to invest in it, the Moore and Simons Foundation. It also allows us to do an in-depth study of the microbes, which are the small single-celled organisms, the phytoplankton, the protists, protozoans, bacteria and viruses. We are able to use state-of-the-art novel molecular techniques to elucidate these various assemblages. USC has a very strong group of microbial ecologists. Um, as you may know, microbes are everywhere. They are the base of the food chain and are tremendously important in the cycling of important elements that are the building blocks of all life, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, et cetera, et cetera. And several um, USC faculty use this data, particularly Jay Furman, Dave Karen, Cameron Thrash, and Will Berylson. And, um, for those scientists out there, there is a special, or students or teachers that want to um, check it out, there's a special SPOT website, and the data is available for use by other researchers to look at and to use and compare and make predictions. A sustainable aquaculture, another major focus of the USC biology group has been in studying marine population dynamics. We do so from a special perspective, we look at how the tools of the recent genomic revolution can give us quantum changes in our understanding of marine animals. We use, we use the tools to understand why some animals grow fast and some grow slow, while some die and some survive. And we use them to look at how organisms are related to each other and how that influences whether they're, their growth. It's really a merger of um, physiology and population genetics, again, all using latest molecular approaches and some of the work is very relevant to aquaculture, which again is becoming a really hot topic on the West Coast and around the world. In particular, the biology and genetics of some commonly important bivalve species like oysters and mussels, as well as various algae, macroalgae, in particular the kelps. Our researchers uh, work with the agriculture industry to help adjust challenges and generate solutions and the current major challenge challenges ocean acidification, which can affect the ability of shellfish to lay down their shells. So we're asking how do oysters and mussels respond to changing oceans? How can we selectively breed for better success? And is it possible to speed up the growth to bring them to more quickly to the markets? In terms of our macroalgal and kelp research, for the last few years, we've been working on creating new technologies and breeding advances to actually farm kelp kelp are very important ecosystem habitats for other organisms. They're important to various compounds, to extract various compounds. They're important as a food source. 
People are looking at feeding it to cows to offset the methane that cows produce. They're also potentially can be turned into biofuels. And I'm just going to talk about three um, USC projects which are focused on macroalgae and kelp. Uh, one of them is this one down here on the bottom. It's a D Department of Energy program, which has been interested in using kelp as a biofuel fuel. Actually, they've been interested in using kelp as a biofuel for quite some time now, but I think we're getting closer to having this maybe as a sustainable source of, of energy. So the kelp farm is called the Kelp Elevator Project, and actually they've designed a system that can move um, a very special system hung from a buoy that can actually hold kelp at the surface during the daylight hours so that they can photosynthesize in the light. And at night, they actually I have a, a cable and pulley that they can move it to depth where there are more nutrients for them to take up during the evening when they're not photosynthesizing. And, and I think the study's preliminary found that, found that we did, we're, we're, that the kelp elevator did increase um, the growth of the kelp compared to a, a control group of kelp that were planted at depth nearby the elevator system. So they actually planted small kelp and then followed their growth. Um, and the third project looking at macroalgae is by Dr. Doug Capone. Um, it's, um, he basically has worked around the world throughout all the oceans and throughout the ocean and various seas to look at um, process of nitrogen fixation, which is how microbes um, convert nitrogen gas from the air into a biologically useful form um, for, other, for the organisms that fix it, as well as to exude it for use by other organisms. And they've been asking the questions, do kelp have nitrogen fixing microbes? and macro, kelp and microalgae on their surfaces, could it help them get more nitrogen and be more productive? And they have found that some young macroalgae do have nitrogen fixers and that different species of decomposing macroalgae have significant amounts of nitrogen, nitrogen fixation, which enriches the water. And um, I've already talked about the fact that our cove is a marine protected area and a site of a lot of our research projects over the years. So we've been interested in the marine, bi marine bio biodiversity of this area. How many species of organisms are there out there? Um, and this project has been done by Dr. David Ginsberg from Environmental Studies and with a number of undergraduate students. He's been conducting multiple year studies of Catalina by scuba surveys and these are looking primarily at the larger organisms that you can visually see. And he's found that there are about 1,100 species in the Blue Cavern Marine Reserve. And there are something like 2,200 species throughout, the, uh, Catalina, throughout Catalina Island. Um, they've also been looking at the habitat complexity and fish communities in relation to any observed changes over time in terms of dis different species disappearing um, from overfishing or for other reasons and other species invading. And there has been a, a recent invasion by a species of macroalga called Sarcasm horneri, which seems to be taking over and outcompeting our native giant kelp and does seem to be perhaps a, an effective temperature. But again, we're doing a lot of study in that area. We've had a number of faculty and grad students uh, looking at the interactions of this invasive species with other species of algae and other organisms as well as uh, local fish populations. One of the newer members of the Marine Environmental Biology Group um, is Dr. Carly Kenkel, who's a, an expert working on coral bleaching. She's worked on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and the Florida Keys Reef Track. And, and Catalina, she and her students are, are looking at an organism which is related to corals, one of the local anemones, which has symbiotic microalgae similar to corals. And under stress in corals and anemones, this partnership breaks down resulting in an expulsion of the algae by the coral or the anemone, which is known as bleaching. But the intertidal anemones at Catalina seem to be much more tolerant of temperature stresses than their cousins, the corals. So we're hoping that by studying the relationship in anemones, we can hopefully gain some important insight into help save the, the coral reefs, which are suffering quite a bit as the oceans warm. Um, and finally, I think this is our last research study I'll talk about is um, ocean acidification and ocean alkalinization. And this is conducted by Doctors Will Berylson and Scott 
apple bomb um, and potential for um, one of the biggest problems um, for mitigation is the increase in atmospheric CO2 in both the oceans and atmosphere. It's pretty much a prime challenge of the 21st century. And hopefully you've all heard about climate change and how it's impacting those, uh, all of us. Um, Dr. Al Applebaum is monitoring ocean acidification at the Catalina Lab to observe how the pH of our local waters is changing over time. He's developing a time series and Dr. Berelson and his students are looking at ocean alkalization, which is the reverse of ocean acidification. It's kind of a neutralization of the acid. And this is a relatively new area that seems to be receiving greater scientific attention. Could we mitigate acidification by buffering, finding ways to offset it by increasing the pH of the system? Can it make a difference in what, what would its potential impact on ocean chemistry and ecology of marine life? So these are just a snapshot of some of the research being conducted at um, the Ridley Marine Science Center by USC faculty. We have a large number of other faculty and grad students that uh, work out there. We also have student researchers and faculty from other institutions that come to work at Catalina. Um, and now on to our education programs. Um, I'll start with the graduate education. The Institute hosts what we call a number of fellowships. Um, that is, we sort of pay students or remunerate students um, for doing their research out on Catalina. Um, and these, these are usually supported by both private, federal, and university funds. And first one here at the top of the list, the Wrigley Institute Summer Fellows has been going on for about 18 plus years. I've actually been running it for about the last seven years. I took it over in 2013 and we recruit students from both USC and non-USC institutions. And we usually provide summer stipends to six to seven USC students. And um, the non-USC students, we provide them with um, free housing and access to the uh, facility. Uh, students are a major part of our outreach and education programs, and they sharpen their communications to various audiences by working with our education staff on the, the island. They participate in all the other education programs we have, serving as mentors and presenters. They participate in our Saturdays at the Lab Visitors Program, talking to a general audience about their research and its importance um, and how important the research they are doing. And they write blogs about the research or their activities on the island. In these summers, they form many new friendships because they're living and working together on the island. Um, it's been incredible to, to watch these students come together. Um, we did recruit a class for this summer, but unfortunately because of COVID, they've not been allowed on the island. We just finally opened up uh, to research a few weeks ago, and so far only three or four students have been able to go out. We're hoping to get them out either in the fall or spring, or we'll have them not have to compete and be able to come out next summer. We'll see how that works out. But here's a list of the participants from the 2019 program a number of uh, USC students from some of the labs we've already talked about, um, the Capone Lab, the Manahan Lab, the Berylson Lab, the Nusden Lab. We had two students from UCLA who worked together focused on the invasive sargassum species. And we had two students from University of California, Santa Barbara working on various aspects of moray eel ecology and interactions in the ecosystem. We had four Cal State students this summer. Huh? Oh, that's right. And we had, uh, sorry about that. We had four Cal State students um, this summer, um, which I, sorry about that. Um, and so we had four Cal State students, two from Northridge, one working on the invasive alga and another on giant sea bass, one from Long Beach um, working on lemon sharks from uh, Dr. Chris Lowe's the Shark Lab, and a fourth from Moss Landing Marine Lab, also looking at the invasive sargassum and how it competes within native kelp and it's a, whether it's a factor of warming. So in terms of undergraduate programs, we do have quite a few of those. Um, we do run uh, this May semester course is actually a, uh, an intensive four week course um, that runs for an entire four weeks all day long. Um, instead of taking, students can reduce their load in the spring 
and take a Maymester course, um, which begins right after the, the end of the semester. Um, they're very intense courses. Um, one of them is focused on uh, biological oceanographic methods, and the other one is on marine, marine microbial ecology. Um, different courses from USC also come out for various field trips, and um, again, for various field work throughout the year. <clears throat> the university also provides uh, support to the students to actually do um, research for credit. So these are our 490s and 492s, and university has also found various um, mechanisms to provide funding for those students to undertake their research to cover their, their expenses. So in some of the projects they worked on are described there. We also have summer research um, at Catalina. Again, these uh, research education for undergraduates is an NSF program that has the students working for about 10 weeks. They usually paired with a faculty member and a grad student on Catalina. And we also have some private funding from a long standing benefactor of the Wrigley Institute, the Zinsmai education funding for undergraduates. Um, as, I say, as I said, often we support a lot of other institutions. Um, Cal State Universities run a full fall semester program each and every year out on Catalina. Unfortunately, I think because of COVID-19, they won't be able to run that program this year. And Humboldt State comes down to um, participate in a, in a dive program and do their checkout dives down in Catalina. And as I've mentioned again, universities in California and around the US can apply to come for weekend or week long visits and use our facilities. Okay, on to our high school student research experiences. Again, we host visits, um, day trips, um, overnight programs, one to two days and week long programs. Uh, we have a program with a ongoing program with the Port of LA High School where we partner with their aquaculture, marine biology, and AP environmental classes. And students from these programs come out to Wrigley and participate in different facets. Marine biology usually conducts fish surveys in the fall and the spring, comparing their data. So they have a, a data set talking about the ecosystem changes that are occurring in those, in those organisms. And then the AP Environmental Studies focuses on island ecology, kelp forest ecology, and sustainability. And then the aquaculture students learn about aquaculture research. They also learn about aquaponics, which is a really interesting program. It's basically farming without soil. You grow fish, fish and plants together in a, in a, uh, a contained system. The, of course, the, the fish and the water are down below and the plants are up above. It's fertilizer free because the fish provide the fertilization, the, the fertilizer through their um, feeding and uh, excrement. And uh, it only uses about 90% less water than conventional farming would require. Our faculty and grad students are working to improve the process, looking at different aspects of it. And we have a, an education program called Food for Thought, where we set up these aquaponic systems throughout the LA Unified Schools and uh, USC undergraduate interns participate in the program and sort of talk to them about concepts of biology, engineering, and sustainability in the classroom. And we host one or two day programs Again, for a variety, mostly of inner city LA schools and programs, which are listed on the slide. Each has a customized schedule that makes us field work, usually snorkeling, kayaking, looking at the intertidal organisms or working on the mud flat um, to lab studies, basically doing microscopy on the plankton, looking at how animals behave. Again, learning about the aquaponics systems and different kinds of sustainability projects. And depend and more, much, much more of this time available. And we do feel that it's essential to provide young students first term opportunities and experience, actually immerse them in the environment or in the ocean so they might see potential careers or just become better stewards of the environment. Often for these students, it's their first trip on a boat to a college campus to spend time with others who know science is amazing and that there's so much to learn and understand and innovate. And finally, uh, but not, certainly not the least, are some of our community engagement programs. We run a number of Earthwatch monitoring programs. We usually host about um, five groups spread out through the year to, to join in participatory, participatory science, also sometimes called citizen science. Last year, we hosted three groups of students and two groups of adults, and they were engaged in some of our long-term monitoring efforts, including a harmful algal bloom watch, our intertidal monitoring, our marine protected area watch, 
and marine mammal monitoring. Again, this helps us to better fill data gaps as well as understanding changes over time. Um, and student groups have come from throughout the United States and the adults in addition to coming from the US have come from Europe, Japan and Canada. Another long-standing program that we have for, has been the Catalina, Catalina Conservation Divers Program. Over 20 years of temperature and marine biology data have been collected and then culled entirely by volunteer divers. And finally, is our Catalina, uh, is our, uh, Catalina Naturalist class for the Los Angeles area. We led and partnered in providing the ocean science portion for the Catalina Conservancy. And this course provides a, a certification as well as university credits for those interested in learning more about natural history of California and then being able themselves to provide interpretation about the natural history of California. So I just wanna acknowledge that it takes a village. I'm thankful to the many, many colleagues from Wrigley and Sea Grant who contributed support, discussions, photos, slides, and text for this presentation. Ann Close, Maurice Roper, Julie Brown, Diane Kim, John Heidelberg is the actual director of the uh, Marine Science Center on Catalina. Jessica Dust Dutton, who um, will now be taking over some of my duties as she will become the director of research, which is great. Um, Linda Chilton, who's our marine educator for Sea Grant and works very closely with the Wrigley folks and the entire Wrigley and Sea Grant staffs for all their years of dedication to our programs. And I'll just do a shout out to David Horreen, who's a great, great nephew of Albert Ulrey and shared a, a PowerPoint and some interesting stories about um, Ulrey with me one day on Catalina. He's a wonderful uh, um, historian. And I also want to thank uh, Altice and Robin O for inviting me to give this presentation. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions and please come and join us and get involved on, with the Wrigley Marine Science Center on Santa Catalina Island. Hopefully Scott's coming back. <laughs> hey Scott. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, so we got some questions. Uh, are you ready to just dive right in? Ready. Perfect. All right, so so we had a couple questions about you went out and gave a good overview of of all the programs that are offered and and kind of all the research they're doing. So so we have a couple of high school teachers in here um, week after week asking what opportunities are there for young people to study and even work in the field. Um, how would how would one go about getting these research experiences and and for these, and you went over some summer programs, how, or in volunteer programs, what exactly would those students be doing during that, during those period, those experiences? Well, for the high school students, primarily the experiences are, you know, coming out with their teachers and, and, uh, and, and our staff members. So basically um, contacting us and, you know, letting us know that the teachers and the students would like to come out and experience Catalina and some of the research opportunities. Having high school students is, uh, doing science programs has become a really big uh, liability issue. We always, if we have high school students out, even undergraduate students, anybody under 18, we have to have really close supervision. But um, as I say, we do run these um, one and two day programs. Again, we have a curriculum online that's the uh, Island Explorer. So I would say get involved with, with them. And then there are a lot of, um, I know there are a lot of, mainland programs that are easier to get involved with down at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, which again is close to you guys in Altice. They actually have high school students doing marine research down there and again in San Pedro. So I would have them look at some of those opportunities. It's for high school students, as I say, it's mainly these field trips and programs along those lines. So similarly, um, Samuel just asked about undergraduate uh so he's a he says he's an undergraduate environmental science major at cal state university channel islands and he's currently doing uh restoration on the channel island how does he go about getting involved with catalina island projects uh, well actually one of uh, one of the, one of the faculty members at cal state uh what, cal state channel islands uh dr corey gaza has had some fairly long-term projects at um, Catalina, mainly where he's been looking at lobsters and other types of things. So um, 
this is undergrad. So I, w- I would say to talk with Corey and see if he could, and the other Marine folks that might be there in that program and see if there are others that are interested in Catalina. Um, as I say, you could apply for one of our research education for undergraduates. Those are not just USC students. We uh, recruit those uh, usually in the spring of each year. And we usually have, I think now we're up to about 10 students in that program. And they pretty much all work with a, a faculty member and a graduate student mentor on Catalina. So that might be to look on our website for that opportunity. It's called NSS REU Research Education for Undergraduates REU. So, so hey, we just keep getting questions about the the um, the volunteer and summer experience programs. So, Mark asks, are there any engineering programs ongoing or interest developing and in focusing on testing and development of undersea or on the surface on the surface robotics or sensors? Yeah, we've actually had again a, a long term program, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sometimes I forget, but. Uh, Doctor, yeah, we've had a long-term program. This actually worked closely with um, Dr. Chris Lowe's group, and I'm, yeah. of course, blanking on the name of the faculty member at Cal Poly Pomona, I believe he has. And he's been doing a lot with robotics out uh, at Catalina, tracking sharks and other types of fishes. So yeah, and then we've had a um, number of people in the uh, engineering department at USC, likewise, that have been looking at different engineering aspects. One of the projects we do with students is we actually build, help them or work with them to build their own ROVs, um, put them together. They do all the engineering of them. They actually fit them together. They actually do the uh, electronics and everything. So um, that might be something that, you know, he could possibly come out and volunteer with some of our youth groups. Yeah, and you mentioned Chris Lowe, and I we, we had him on um, in earlier live chat. So you can go check that out the website I put in the chat. But um, he was talking about all the all the crazy technology they're using to track sharks and yeah. and um, monitor their movement. It's it's really an, a fascinating field. Yeah, he's um, had quite a few students out of USC doing that over these last you know ten or twenty years. So yeah, they call him Doctor Shark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, he was, it was a really good one. So I, I would recommend yeah. everyone no, check it out. Um, yeah. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I imagine it's he's he's as charismatic as the sharks are. <laughs> Oh man. Okay, so I had prefaced you on this one, and um, our one of our longtime viewers, Ryan, every time asks, uh, "What ocean is your favorite?" Now, I think you'd have a more interesting answer than most because you spent um, time on the East Coast, the West Coast. So you you've experienced those, and you also said you spent some time in Antarctica. So, um, what are your thoughts on that one? Well, I guess for Samuel, I guess yeah, I just most probably heard it before from other people. I think uh, my uh, my uh, marine policy person uh, Melody mentioned it. But uh, as scientists, we look at the ocean as one giant ocean that's all inter interconnected in the interconnected seas. So, but uh, I actually love all my oceans. <laughs> I've, as you say, I've gotten to spend uh, some incredible time um, in them and on them, and uh, you know. In the when I was a graduate graduate student of the University of Miami in the in the seventies, the, the Florida Reef Track was just absolutely amazing. I've been out to visit the uh, Great Barrier Reef and um, over time and see the see the changes that have occurred in both of those environments. As you say, I recently, maybe about five or six years ago, was able to dive into the Red Sea for some projects, and uh, I've actually. Uh, as I think I said to you, I actually have immersed myself in Antarctic waters <laughs> just to, at the time, just to, just to see what it was like, it was very frigid, but growing up on the east coast of the United States, <laughs> it was interesting and haven't actually plunged into the Arctic Ocean, but I've plunged into some of the uh, North Slope lakes, which are pretty, pretty exhilarating, but you know, they all just have such different uh, organisms and environments that they're, they're just absolutely, I guess, fascinating to me anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to thank Ryan again. He he's he's uh every week tunes in. It's really awesome, and and he has a fascination with people and their favorite oceans. So that's a that's awesome. Thank you again. Um, so kind of on that subject of um, you said a lot of your work. Um, so why why did you become a marine biologist? Why what what sparked the interest for you? Well, I guess I, I have to go back to my roots. 
He grew up in the ocean state, the great state of Rhode Island. So that really, uh, I guess it, I went to the University of Rhode Island and they had a school of oceanography right down on uh, Narragansett Bay and uh, um, it just became ever more fascinated with it. So I pursued my, uh, my undergraduate degree was in biology, but then after that I went on to sort of a biological oceanography program at the University of, of Miami because even though I loved Rhode Island, the waters were very cold <laughs> and studying them for any long period of time was uh, not as easy. I slipped off of marine jetties in the ice and snow. So Florida seemed very attractive at the time and indeed it was very attractive. Got to visit the uh, nearby islands of the Bahamas and the Caribbean. So again, I didn't even cover those as fantastic uh, realms to study. So, but I think, you know, I was really lucky. Again, I don't know how, it, we always say that it does happen this way. I had a fantastic high school biology teacher who just, um, he made biology absolutely fascinating. And so I became a, you know, a, a, an undergraduate biology major. And then just, as I say, more and more time on the oceans brought me to oceanography. And again, if you, oceanography is a very unique field because you're either at some place like a marine lab or you're out on a, a big oceanographic ship. So you make all these incredible friends all around the world. It's kind of a, Pretty fascinating life and career. That's awesome. Um, all right. So, so Ben wants to know. He wants to ask you about the Wrigley family because of the Wrigley Institute um, and their fortune and how that has positively impacted ocean research. Do you have any insights on that? Yeah. Well, as I say, they're you know they're fantastic. I mean, the fact that they pr protected Catalina from being developed. I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to go out there, but it's just a uh, it's, it's what you imagine that LA looked like back in the 1910s, 1920s. It's just 85% of it is forever preserved as a conservation natural environment. So they're not just marine, but they've really impacted environmental scientists. They're very, um, very uh, positive on conservation and environmental science. And as I say, they, you know, they gave 14 um, acres of land. Who knows what that land is actually worth? I, I don't know if anybody's ever put a, a dollar value on it. It's a pretty spectacular piece of land. And they've been, uh, when they, you know, basically gave money for research, they continue to do that. Um, actually, uh, they endowed the, the directorship for the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies. And they also in, in, um, endowed you know, put in a big chunk of money. Um, usually it takes something like $5 million to endow a professorship. So that covers the professor's salary and benefits and all that. And sitting right next to me is my spouse. And one of the reasons we're out here is he's the first Wrigley professor in 1999. So after they hired the director. So they've just been incredibly generous and they continue, as I say, they're currently on our board and they just continue to um, basically endow different types of programs for us and advise us and uh, wonderful people. That's all I can say. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so we had a question a little bit more scientific based than, uh, than most. So Harry asked early on regarding microplastics, how much of an increase of microplastics in the ocean have you seen over the years and what kind of negative impacts do microplastics have on the health of the oceans? the creatures and life forms that make the oceans their home, as well as the impact upon the health of humans. Right, well, that's a really um, rapidly expanding field. There are many, um, again, if you go to the Wrigley chats, we had a, just had a Wrigley chat a few weeks back by one of our uh, uh, assistant professors, Megan Feischer, and she's um, very, very involved in uh, the marine plastics. We call it actually marine plastic pollution, because that's what it is. And again, a number of people here in, uh, in the San Pedro area, the Al Galita Foundation, they've been out there um, cataloging the plastics. And it's, it's, it's really a severe problem. And some of it you can't even see. It's microscopic plastics. Um, it's fabric, you know, microplastic fabrics from your clothing that make it through the, uh, the, um, the sewage treatment plant. So we pretty much find it everywhere, as I, as I would say, throughout the oceans. They found it. They found plastic bags and plastics in the deepest depths of the ocean. Um, it's everywhere. Actually, I will do my shout out. The one of the worst things um, is uh, helium balloons when they get loose and they uh, fly away. They frequently, when you're out on a boat, you'll see them on the surface of the ocean. And those, unfortunately, they uh, 
lot of sea turtles and sea mammals try to eat them and really affect their health. And, and we're more recently finding that, you know, humans are starting to, are actually through some of their food sources are ingesting microplastics. So it's, it's, a, it's a big area. And actually Wrigley, right now we're involved in writing a proposal to look at more about uh, how marine plastics are affecting the uh, people in, along the coast and the organisms. Huge. Oh, wow. That is I, huge. I, if you look at makers, I didn't take down the numbers, but the constant increase, you know, the plastics again, you know, just been, we use them for more and more things. And now, unfortunately, thanks to COVID-19, as you've noticed, everybody's gone back to plastic bags, to plastic masks, to plastic gloves. So, I mean, I think we'll have groups of students and people out there, but they're just everywhere. I know I walk along the coast most mornings and you just see the gloves and the masks discarded and you know they're gonna eventually end up in the water. So big problem, but not just in marine, in the fresh waters as well. Same thing, people need to be, you know, and need to recycle and take care of their, their trash, I guess. Yeah, so you just brought it up, um, but it's very topical with, with COVID-19. How is, um, how is your research centers responding to that? Have you, have you, and especially with the increase of use of plastic, have you seen um, that negatively impacting our oceans to a huge degree? I, I don't know, you know, we haven't had a chance to, you know, again, people can't, everybody's social distancing. I think I mentioned a while back that um, I haven't been to my, I've been to my office once since uh, March and I haven't been out to the Marine Lab um, since then either. We just, just opened the Marine Lab. So I think, you know, we ourselves are, I, maybe um, Dr. Feischer's lab is, again, we sort of go out and collect them and measure them. But I, I think that's going to be projects for the future for sure. But I don't know how it's impacted right now. Yeah, awesome. Um, so we have like one more question and this comes from Jeremy. Um, kind of just, if you are passionate about this subject, what, what is your advice for people that maybe maybe from even high schoolers to middle schoolers to adults that have have had careers and want to still help out in this field um what's your advice you'd give them um to kind of pursue their passion in this field um i'd say you know try and get involved in the in the different like as i say you know besides uh i mean we like to get people involved in our programs they can join we have a group called the friends of the wrigley institute which are folks that actually contribute to the, the research and the education at Wrigley. Um, a lot of them are people that have boats and we basically, they can come out to Catalina and use our moorings in the, in the Big Fisherman's Cove. We also run various kinds of programs for them, various education programs and lecture series. Um, so that's one way, I guess if you're, a, if you're a, a middle school or high school student, I guess, you know, just basically, um, work hard on the sciences, work, study your study your biology, but again, a lot of downfall for a lot of people is chemistry. You've got to, got to crack that chemistry because again, it's so important now in so much of the work we do. Um, again, mathematical skills are very important. Um, so I would say to, for the younger students to focus on that, but, um, but then to get, you know, and get involved in these various, again, I, I mentioned there's a lot of informal science centers around the area. Cabrillo and the Aquarium of the Pacific that have student volunteers as well. And they're great places to go and look at the, the charismatic megafauna. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for this. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in. This has been a pleasure. Um, this presentation is actually our last Project Blue at Summer live chat series. Uh, the Project Blue at Fall series begins September 11th at noon with the launch of the Blue Hour which is a unique, spectacular drive-in drive -in experience supporting Project Blue's educational programming. The Blue Hour will be on October 10th, 2020 at the Battleship Iowa parking lot in San Pedro. Tickets will be going on sale September 8th. Um, so please don't miss our September 11th live chat featuring Alta C trustee and Civica's founder, Cynthia Hirshhorn. Cynthia will be interviewing Mason Rothschild and Annie Sperling, two multi-sensory multi artists creating The Blue Hour, a one-night-only commissioned art installation projected over the USS Battleship Iowa in collaboration with world-renowned artist Rafik Anadol. 
Mason and Annie will discuss their process and inspiration in creating an exhibit that takes ocean data and turns it into art. Um, so that'll be coming out shortly. Please be sure to stay tuned to our social media channels. We'll be promoting this um, and you'll find all the links there. And I just thank you so much, Dr. Duguay. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me too, Scott. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you to Brian again and uh, all the C folks for inviting me to do this. It's really been fun to bring all these uh, thoughts and pieces together. I haven't done it in quite a while, so I enjoyed it very much. Thank Absolutely. You. And I just want to tell you, I hope everyone tuning in has a great weekend. Talk to you guys.